Hello and welcome to the Plant Paradigm Podcast, where we have inspiring conversations with amazing individuals from all around the world and look for ways to create a clean, green and sustainable future for us, the planet and all humans. I'm your host, Tom Simak, a fellow plant eater and athlete who strives to optimize every living ecosystem. Passionate about looking up for this beautiful floating rock we call home and all the lovely creatures that live among it. This is your monthly paradigm, your wrap up of all things plants, environment, veganism, and what's really going on in the world. And for this show, in this part of the month, we have my beautiful co host, Sean Harrington. How are you? This is what your third or fourth time doing the monthly paradigm? I don't know, third, fourth? Yeah. Yeah, well, we've got this beautiful setup right now in the van. So we moved into this beef about a month ago, just a month ago, and we are really learning the ropes and have a lot of things to learn as we find out. The setup, if you're watching on the YouTubes, is... Um, our little lounge room. A little lounge room, I guess, and we're trying this two mic setup that looks kind of messy, kind of neat, and you will most definitely hear the road. We are set up at a campsite. Um, with our back door and sliding door open because it is 33 or 34 degrees today. It was uh, damn hot. It was so hot. We couldn't even concentrate on doing anything. Um, and our AC is broken. So we, <laughs> we had a very interesting 24 hours and we were recording this late at night just because we just couldn't do it during the day. It was just going to be too unbearable. No way. Like I had my top and I, I've changed, I made it change colors like that many times just from the sweat. It was just... It's stupid. And, you know, I think it's interesting to see what life is like. Because people say, I always say I love the hot weather. But yes, when you, you can't control the environment with an AC when possible, it is a very different experience. I think you like to holiday and to dip in the ocean or the pool when it's this hot. Yeah. Which not, is great. Yeah. How good is that? But not live without an AC and... We're amongst the conditions, so... Yeah, pretty much. We feel everything. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's this good saying that putting on the AC is actually warming the planet, right? Yes. So it's this whole, like, paradox that's ironic. What does Darren call it? Uh, fatal the fatal convenience. convenience. So it's just where we realise how convenient it actually is, though. But at the same time, I understand we're trying to live as eco as possible. But we need to be able to live. Yeah, but that was, <laughs> it's just, you know, you're just sweating all the time and you're agitated, but that's, um, sorry, that's life up north. We're tropical North Queensland right now. And that's, that's we're life. in Townsville. Very, yeah, we were in Townsville. Um, oh, we were, we were, we were, when we're in between some random campground. If I look outside right now without looking at the lights, it'd be stars everywhere, which is beautiful. It is. What have we got planned for this episode? We've got a lot. Yeah. Oh, I do, and I think you do too, and I think it's majority good news. Yeah, I feel like I've got a lot of good news. Yeah, I feel like sometimes we play a very, very fine line between being like the most cynical show <laughs> on the podcasting apps and, and trying to have an optimistic outlook on life. Well, it's hard because we live in Australia who... Uh, mm. We really struggle with climate change. Yeah, we, we just... we. Most people don't even think it exists. I, I don't want to say most people. Everyone who wears a bloody suit in parliament don't, don't really know. And I say, I'm saying everybody again, but... You mean ScoMo. Yeah, I'm trying to play around the word ScoMo and the Morrison government. Yeah. Um, so that's that's interesting. Just before we got here last week, we actually visited the Daintree. We did. It was amazing. Yeah, you, you kind of see... I've seen so many photos. And after talking to Jimmy Halfcut, who's been interviewed on the show, he just has so many beautiful things to say about it. And we've, you know, donated a fair bit to Half Cut and we started a fundraiser and I had half a beard for a while to help the Dane Tree. And to actually see it in person was absolutely incredible. You really feel the connection. Mm. It's incredible. And for those who don't know, the Dane Tree Rainforest is the oldest rainforest on this planet um, by, I think it was like 120 million years older yeah, than the Amazon. anywhere from 120 to 80 million. They're not... They're not sure, right. <laughs> Which is a big variance, but... Yeah, and it's the only place in the world where two World Heritage Sites are right next to each other, and that one being the Great Barrier Reef. 
So there's like this saying that they that should never have been two, should have been one, because the Absolutely. Daintree tree is where the rainforest meets the reef, and they feed off each other. Uh, definitely. So it was incredibly beautiful going there, seeing the wildlife, and seeing this ocean that's almost untouched. Pristine. Pristine. Like on the lookouts, you just see like no one. You can't get there. Like. Nah. And what, we got the drone up and we could see a turtle just crystal clear. Yeah, yeah. I got the drone up in a few places around Port Douglas and and Daintree. And, yeah, I just wanted to go marine life spotting because how cool are animals, right? And, yeah, we we spotted a few turtles. One turtle happened to be huge, you know, going out the water, taking a breath, beautiful. We saw lots of stingrays. Yeah, heaps. Um, Heaps of turtles, though. We saw heaps and heaps of turtles. So cool. It is very cool to really appreciate the wildlife and the de- and it kind of you know makes me excited to in the future again donate to half cut because you see this thing that's really beautiful and you're like yeah I want to spend more time saving that well also you want other people to be able to appreciate it mm. not just our generation or the next generation you want generations to come to be able to to appreciate it mm. which you know uh, when we were on we did guided tours for both the Daintree and the Great Barrier Reef. In On both of the tours, I don't know if you realised, they both said that the media really talks up the problems. Yeah, I didn't want to arc up during that helicopter tour. Yeah. Yeah, we went over the Barrier Reef and you look at it and the guy, he said something like 95% of the reef has been restored. Yes. So we had like a 30% coral bleaching in the Great Barrier Reef, which is the world's largest reef. I think it spans something yeah. like 2,300 kilometers. It goes from uh, Bundaberg, which is just north of Brisbane, which is one of the main cities here in Australia, all the way up to Papua New Guinea. Um, so it's an absolutely huge stretch. So, I don't think it goes to Papua New Guinea. I think it goes up to Papua New Guinea because it is 2,300 kilometers, houses over 5,000 mammals and sea life. I think mm. it goes it goes pretty up there. You can see it from space. Yeah. So it is an incredible wonder. It's one of the seven natural wonders of the world. Yeah. So, even the um, what was she that did the presentation? What, what was oh, the marine biologist. Yeah, she said the same the same thing. thing. So three people that were yeah. experts in their field said the exact same thing. I'm like, I, I just I don't know. Like, I think it's really naive of them for like to say, and, you know, she is a professional mm. in this field. She, I don't think she should be saying that. We also didn't fact check that. That that could be true, but what I worry about. With that, it's like, yeah, it's repaired now, but what if it's only temporarily repaired and there's damages that has been permanently caused? Well, we know there have has been. Right. Well, we know the well, the first mammal to ever go extinct ever in Australia was a something. It was, it was one in the possum family, Malapsus. I forgot the marsupial name. Marsupial of some sort. Yeah, some marsupial actually was on an island, native to this island, on the Great Barrier Reef, and the island sea level rose and he lost his home. Really? So that's the first mammal that ever went extinct in Australia, to, to my knowledge, and that was actually recorded by Nat Geo. I remember reading about it last year. I actually read about it in um, Lifespan of oh, all books. Okay. Yeah, and I, I searched it up. I'm like, this is actually legit. Yeah, I've never heard of this. Yeah, so we've we've got all this irreversible damage. It's like, yeah, it looks okay now, but what about all the marine life that has actually died? Like, is the ecosystem in balance? Like, are we talking about these things, or are you just saying only five percent didn't recover? And five percent of two thousand three hundred kilometers of a lot. reef is a lot. And that's an ecosystem. Yeah. You know, the coral is actually alive, from you know, unpopular belief. But it is alive. It's a it's a living thing. Mm. Yeah, and you for think five like percent of it to just be gone and irreversible. Mm. Yeah, it's it's um really sad to think, and I, I really think if the media and I don't really we don't really watch mainstream no, we news, don't. so we don't yeah. really know what the media is saying. But I think I agree. I think they should be saying how bad it is. For mm. people to be afraid and scared that, hey, it might not last. Let's make some changes. Yeah, absolutely. The, the la- we want we don't want the opposite. We don't want people to be complacent. Thinking, okay, like, yeah, it's all right. It's just five percent. Like mm. it sounds like a small number, but that is a lot. You know what? Actually, we're recording this on thirty first late at night, and tomorrow mm. is my six year veganversary. Whoa! Six 
years. So it's been a long journey. It also is World Vegan Day. It, it is, yeah. World Vegan Day. And where are we going to be? We're going to be in Early Beach. So oh, let's try to find at a night. Yeah, we'll look on Happy we'll, Cow. We'll try to find a place to celebrate. Hmm. Um, and yeah, the, the people over at Vegan Easy reached out to see if I could just talk about them for a bit. And I really like Vegan Easy as, a, I guess, they're almost like a resource. Um, when I first started doing activism, I would give out Vegan Easy books on the street. Wow. And they had like recipes. They had uh, testimonials from Australian bodybuilders. Athletes. So I didn't know they've been going for that long. Yeah, I I had no idea they did more than booklets. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, yeah, the guys over there reached out just to talk about it. So every November, they actually do a 30-day vegan challenge. Right. They well, offer... this kind of kicked off my veganism, didn't it? Well, no, this was Veganuary. Yeah, I know, but something but, yeah, like something that. Something like this, exactly, like a 30-day challenge. So um, for everyone who actually joins on, so this will be released tomorrow on the 1st. So it's a full 30-day of resources getting emailed every day. You can join their Facebook groups as well, which we know Facebook groups are super supportive. People yeah. asking questions. You have access to mentors. So if you're having a problem like giving up dairy or you don't know what um, – how to switch up your meals to make sure you're still getting adequate nutrition or you just you have some common questions it could be about protein iron b12 how to supplement any anything like that and don't feel silly asking these questions either no. someone else will have the same question so you putting it out there is just going to help someone else as well for sure yeah it's it's especially good in november one of the ambassadors actually is about doyle who, which we've who have had on the show and um, just a reminder, for those who actually don't do it this month, you can sign up anytime and they do 30-day challenges oh, with an email. They're, just, they're pumping it out now to celebrate World Vegan Day. Cool. And also to celebrate the fact that Australian meat consumption is down 5.5%. Wow. Yeah. So the rise of the flexitarians. Much to your surprise. I was shocked. In fact, when he emailed me that, um, I was like, where'd you get this start? Yeah. <laughs> That's, I honestly said, oh, hey, sounds great. Where'd you get this? What's going on? <laughs> Where's this study? No, I and I, I found it and I downloaded the spreadsheet and yeah, our production is up, mm -hmm. but our consumption is down. That's that's excellent. Yeah. We just need to work on production. Yeah. But we'll start a, start a consumption. I'll take that as a win. Yeah. Well, speaking of consumption, Amsterdam is being urged to reduce their plant their sorry their meat consumption by 50% Whoa. by 2030. That's a lot. Huge. 50%? How yeah. are they, do you they know how they're planning on doing that? No. So there's a few things that they've got in place, and this is a lot to do with climate change, mm -hmm. but I think it's mostly to do with their health boom. So they're really trying to boost the health of all of their residents. Yeah. There was a stat that they put out. Recent studies indicate that 62% of adults across the Netherlands will be overweight by 2040. 62%? Yeah. That's that's quite high. Very high, especially... Considering, um, like, they bike everywhere. Correct. Yeah. So, it would be, like, it must... Their diet must be just horrendous at the moment. And, of course, you've got to think about it's the younger generation that are going to mm. be older by 2040. So, it's starting at the younger wow. age which is why the town planner is on board with banning all the fast food around schools. I really like that idea. Yeah. Because it's super, you know what it's like, yeah. super easy to say, oh, after school I'll go to Macca's. Or your parents or... just like, they, they're working, they can't be bothered cooking, hey, just here's five bucks. Yeah. Just go grab. After school, just go get something. That's yeah. really cool. So the leaders in the town planner are really working towards that. Look, they're looking at actually banning it completely. They're not quite there yet. Right. Um, but, yeah, that's that's the whole reason they're really trying to push a, a health boost. Like, what's the U.S. overweight? Oh, their overweight is probably pushing 70%. Yeah. I think I it was think, 35 40%. Isn't Australia obese. just as bad? Yeah. We, have, we actually have worse overweight numbers yeah. in Australia, but we – have nowhere near as much obese. Yeah, okay. Um, but actually, I'm really thankful you brought up fast food, if, you, if you're done with your point there. And that yeah. was a very impressive segue that you, Thank you. you used. 
All right, there's a study that actually came out on the 27th of October. So this is fresh. Freshy. This is really fresh. And I've got to be honest, we obviously on this podcast talk a lot about environment. And when it comes to health, it's something that's definitely deserves its own highlight. And this has got to be one of the most atrociously scary health studies that I've read that everyone needs to know, vegans alike. This isn't, look, the fact that... I'm really scared. (laughs) You should be. The fact that red meat is linked to cardiovascular disease is scary enough, right? These saturated fat, cholesterol, all all this stuff's incredibly important to talk about. However, there was a recent study um, that looked at... Well, firstly, no one thinks fast food is healthy, no. right? McDonald's, Burger you King, are Pizza Hut. Kidding yourself if you do. No, nah, no chance in hell. But what if I told you it's worse than what we think? Oof. I wouldn't be surprised to be honest. So, but tell us. Get this: I'm in the process of reading the whole paper, so I'm. St- but I've got the, the I've got the key points. Okay. So it was actually published in Nature by the Journal of Exposure Science and Environmental Epidemiology, and the key points are the researchers tested. 64 top menu items from McDonald's, Burger King, Pizza Hut, Domino's, Taco Bell, and Chipotle. Not the, Domino's. Not do- <laughs> they obtained hamburgers, fries, chicken nuggets, chicken burritos, cheese pizza, amongst other things. 64 food samples they got, right? And they got three pairs of gloves. So what they're actually using to handle the food, right? The workers. The workers. They analyzed them. That's so weird. Yeah. They analyzed them for 11 chemicals using gas, chromatography, and mass spectrometry. Uh, Mass spect... I can't say it. Sounds like something from Harry Potter. Yeah. Chromatography (laughs) and mass spectrometry. Oh, you got that. Got it. They found that 80% contained a phthalate linked to heightened risk of asthma and 70% tied to reduce fertility whoa items made with meat had higher levels of phthalates while french fries and cheese pizza had the lowest and to the researchers knowledge these are actually the first measures of deht in food and deht being one of the most dangerous phthalates so there's different compounds of phthalates and You've probably heard us talk about phthalates on the show. It's a type of plastic. Plastic, yeah. That's I was just inc- thinking I remember this from something. Yeah, yeah. so it's spelled P-H-T-H-A-L-A-T-E-S. So how is this getting into our food? So it's just microplastic. So it's through the processing. Also, you got to remember that they a lot of farms, especially in the U.S., feed animals plastic. Yeah. Right, so they we grind up. recently see yeah, that. They grind up the yeah. mulch and then they add. This is common. This isn't like. Uh, conspiracy or anything. This is common practice. You can find this on probably pigpoultry.com or whatever it is. How horrendous. Phthalates and, and the gloves, they're leaking these plastics because obviously heat, because mm. it's petroleum, right? So heat's extracting this plastic into the food that you then ingest. That's And lim- of course, it's not just going to be meat products. No. Of course, there's going to be, be yeah, more in vegan, meat products. Vegan products as well. Just from the gloves. They didn't even test. I don't think they tested the vegan products. Not, not. I just read, I skimmed through it. I didn't see any mention of veganism or plant based. Yeah. So I think. It was but just, they've tested. It's what it sounds like. They've tested non-vegan food, but it's like if it's on the gloves. Mm, doesn't matter. It's going to transfer yeah. anyway. So this is incredibly scary. So we know, from research, just as a way of background, that phthalates can cause infertility through. Your mother. So they looked at birth mothers mainly in like South America and they looked at the anogenital distance, which is pretty much just how big your penis is. And they looked at from a newborn to teenagers. They looked at the plastic inside the mother's urine upon birth. And then they, they followed the kids, specifically the male child, but they also looked at females um, through the years. And they found that males had lower testosterone and smaller penises. Now, what this wasn't it low sperm count as well, and a low sperm count, yes. So, what this meant is they kind of rattled off this number that you know we always hear we'll have more um, plastic than fish in the ocean by 2050. We're going to be infertile by 2048. So, this is in your fast foods that you're consuming. Like, that is not only is it 
literally poison for your body. It's literally more poison for your body. And this is something that has no one thought to study this. Phthalates has really come on the market, I guess, not that long ago. We're talking 2005, the first kind of studies around phthalates. And then with after that, a few years later, then the studies on the South American women came out. It's not the oldest thing. But the fact that we haven't looked into this, what what else are we missing? You know, this study came out three days ago, four days ago for the first time ever. Well, it's not just going to be fast food either. No. It's going to be the, you know, the the meat that you're buying off the shelf in the supermarket. It's the little plastic containers that you get from the Asian takeaway places. Mm. It's But it's, it's going to be any meat product if they're feeding plastic yeah. to the animals. It's, it's just going to be. Yeah. So anyone who's really still eating that kind of fast food. Like we have Domino's maybe once a year. You hate Domino's. I hate so. Domino's. <laughs> so even less, but McDonald's, Burger King. Is Taco this study Bell. in the US though? I didn't see where it was, but I'm very much assuming because Burger King. Yeah. Um, could be NZ. I think they have Burger King. I'm not sure. But this, this would be, I think, across the board. I feel like regulations levels. in the US are a lot worse than ours. Yes, and every other almost country. Yeah, but it, yeah, it's especially but if we we're importing and better. exporting. We can't say it's better in Australia because the test hasn't been done. Yeah. We should assume the worst, mm. which is don't touch it with a temporal pole. Scary. It's really scary. We're, we're, we're playing with future generations. Like if you want to have a kid and you're still eating this stuff, Mm. Like they've also, they also found that phthalates, just to add to the, why we should be worried about them, actually led to more miscarriages. Right. So there's a link between that too. Wow. It's it's pretty. Just insane. overall horrible. For yeah. Our we house. don't want to touch it, at all. Like we want to just eliminate as much as possible. But that's my new story. That's that's. I thought it was really interesting. Um, really powerful and I had to share it and I'm doing up a post for it as well for Instagram because it just it's pretty needs to get out pretty, there. pretty scary do you want to kick us off with the next story yeah okay so it's a big one actually there has been a big public figure that's come out to address the meat and dairy industry okay they've I don't know if you would say urged the world, just warned the world to maybe reduce their intake. Yep. Have you read anything about this recently? No. Oh, Prince Charles? I think I heard something, but I, I never looked into it. Yeah. So he had like, he's very big into the climate world now. He's gone to COP26. Really? Awesome. Yep. So is the Queen? No, the Queen's not, not going anymore. What She's happened? sick. No. Yeah, I read today. Not Queenie. Yeah, she unless right? she gets better, she might. She might make some of it. Yeah. But yeah. At the oh, moment, dear. I read today that she wasn't on. Poor Queenie. Liz will, Liz will have to be in bed with the Netflix and stuff. Mm, poor Queen. All right. Well, thanks for shitting on that. <laughs> I did not. <laughs> thanks for correcting me. Prince Charles has personally stopped eating. Meat and dairy for two days a week. Awesome. And fish. Yeah. Sorry, I should have said that. I think it was dairy for just one day, actually. Okay. So he likes his, his dairy a bit. Yeah. But he has kind of warned the world that, you know, it's putting a pressure on our environment. He has said... Is this through, like, interviews and stuff? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, do you know if William went to COP26? I have no idea. You just saw that Queenie couldn't. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, well, more on the royals. Prince William is very outspoken on the environmental issues. And this month he hosted a prize, so a big event, um, alongside David Attenborough, actually. It was called the Earth Shot Prize. Heard anything about that? No, I haven't no. actually. It's really awesome. cool, actually. So, Earshot Earshot is a ten-year scheme, which will award one million pounds to five recipients each year, and they've they just need to present how they're going to overcome climate change and cool. you know make a difference. Yeah. Um, and there are five different categories. 
It is reduce waste, clean air, and revive revive our oceans and climate change. Mm-hmm. So that was actually this month. Do you want to know about the winners? Oh, yeah. Go for it. So Costa Rica was for protect and restore nature. That's good. Costa Rican wildlife would yeah. be absolutely incredible. So they've actually um, doubled the number of trees. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. So they're getting one million pound. Not bad. Not bad. Take it. Clean our air is for India. I'm shocked at that. Well, they created a machine to turn agricultural waste into fertilizer so that farmers don't need to burn their fields and cause air pollution. Okay. Pretty good innovation. Right? Pretty good innovation. Because we were hearing about burning off even here and I was like, why? Yeah, the sugar cane. Yeah. Yeah. Why? I don't know. Because they need to quickly get rid of it and then start the new yield. Yeah, it's just, it's all about being quick. Yeah. Revive Our Ocean was a little place in the Bahamas. So this was a road, a a little project run by two best friends who are growing coral in the Bahamas. Awesome. And it's designed to restore the world's dying coral, which is great for the Great Barrier Reef. Very good. Although we obviously want to preserve what we've got rather than have to grow more because yeah, we know it takes years absolutely mm. and we know that the older it is the more it's sequestering yeah we you know trees everything's like mm-hmm. that isn't it yeah absolutely um they actually found a way to make it grow 50 times faster than it normally takes in nature well i'm very intrigued skeptical and excited about yeah. that well david how can you perfect nature <laughs> yeah i don't I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Well, I hope it is a good solution. Yeah. Yep. Well, it, apparently it had to do with the special tanks that they had. Cool. That they created. Awesome. Another one was build a waste-free world, Milan in Italy. Really? Okay. How'd they do that? Um, they were collecting unused food and giving it to people who needed it most. Really very simple. Very simple, but tackles one of the biggest contributors to climate change, food waste. Correct. And another social problem, world hunger. World hunger. And for our Fix Our Climate, Mm -hmm. it was, well, this must be a company, AEM. They're in Thailand, Germany, and Italy. Cool. So it's a clever design in Thailand using renewable energy to make hydrogen by spitting, splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen is a clean gas, as we've spoken about recently, Um, but it's usually by burning fossil fuels. Mm. I don't know how to respond to that one. Well, if it's a gas come from water, I guess the question is, could it run out? Well, definitely. If our water runs out, you don't have this kind of gas, do you? Yeah. So I don't know how sustainable that is, especially in our climate when we're – when was it we watched a documentary that was saying we wouldn't have fresh water by, was it 2058 yeah. or something? Yeah, it was something like something that. Something ridiculous. Nestle soon. did that study, I think they yeah. said, or something like that. Yeah. That's – I mean, I hope – we don't know. I'm just talking on speculation on this water thing, but I, I hope it's – clean energy not just renewable energy Mm. because there is a difference we don't want to take away from the oceans from the marine life and it's renewable energy for us but it's not clean energy for the planet correct yeah so would yeah we look i'm hoping that they really looked into all of these things but it was an in-person event um a lot of celebs got involved like um ed sheeran shakira emma watson one of the rules was that none of them could fly to london Very cool. Really cool. Um, And they were really asked to be wary of the environment when picking their outfits. So I'm assuming like fur would have totally been inappropriate. Yeah. And also they were really, really conscious, like none of the stage stages were made of plastic, anything like that. Yeah. Really cool. Yeah. I thought so. So I'm, yeah, really interested to see what will happen next year. Or even with these projects that are being made. That's awesome. Some really good stuff in there. 
Um, so this podcast so far has been going for 31 minutes. So I'm not very that good at math like yes, this, are. but um, every minute... $11 million of subsidies goes to fossil fuels. Every single minute. Every single minute on a global scale. Holy 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, $11 million goes to fund that. How crazy is that? And that's what world hunger would need. Definitely not more than that. Yes, this analysis was done by the International Monetary Fund and found the production and burning of coal, oil, and gas was subsidized by 5.9 trillion US dollars in 2020. And not a single country priced its fuels sufficiently to reflect their full supply and environmental costs. The IMF, which is this international group, actually calculated that setting fuel prices that reflect their true cost would actually cut global CO2 emissions by over a third. So we're out here and in Australia, we are paying what a dollar sixty at the moment mm. for a liter of diesel. Uh, it used to be what 90 cents a dollar a few years ago. Yeah. And I think diesel was always a little bit more, but yeah. So what they're saying is this is still too cheap because if it was at $3 or $4 a litre, what would that encourage people to do? Drive less. But it would also mean that fossil fuels become more profitable without subsidies from the government Mm. because at the moment they're hand in hand and that's part of the toxic relationship that they have on themselves and the planet. $11 a minute. Yeah, that's really sad. Yeah, so it's something to think about when you complain about how expensive (laughs) fuel is. You have no idea how much it should be worth, depending on what it really costs, you know, the environment. It's priceless, the environment. Very priceless. What's your next story? I've just got a headline that blew my mind. Okay, I like headlines. California aims to ban recycling symbols on items that aren't recyclable. Why? Please explain. Why are there recyclable icons on something that's not recyclable? Exactly. Is this like that thing in the US where you can put organic on every anything and it's not regulated? Like you can find on on shelves organic gluten-free water. <laughs> you know, like people... It's a sign of greenwashing. This, I, I'm, I'm, it is exactly greenwashing, and I'm not exaggerating about that water. This is an actual product that I've seen photos of. Um, it's pretty pretty incredible that something like that could even get away with because obviously it is exactly greenwashing. It's like the consumer will buy a product that's recyclable. It doesn't have to be recyclable. We just have to put that little symbol. How insane. We watched a documentary on Californian recycling. And they said how good it was. It was was really good. You know what it was? I think it was the food. The food from, like, San Francisco, they didn't waste it. Like, it went into this scrapyard that then went to, like, the farms or something. I I honestly can't remember. I can't remember what doco it was, but I remember thinking, if California can do it, Mm. we can do it. Because they've got a higher population, you know, a lot more dense than Australia, uh, you know. Yeah. Why wouldn't we be able to do what they're doing? We really need to find that doco, but obviously they're not doing so great. Well, I I mean, I've got more questions than the headline could answer, (laughs) but we also don't know how much that could be. It could be one in a thousand products, but it could be a hundred in 200 products. Yeah. It doesn't really matter, but... It doesn't really show the gravity of the situation, but nothing should ever be like that. And I don't know if that's the fault of the U.S. regulation system or if a state should have. Like, that shouldn't be on California. That should be on the U.S. That, yeah, it's outrageous. Like, I don't want to travel from California and to Las Vegas and Nevada, sorry, next door, and have different regulations and symbols to look out for. Who's, who's, why, are you, why is this difficult for the consumer? 
Well, it, it has to we be... know how difficult it is even here. Yeah. Every council, shire, whatever, has mm. their own recycling rules. That's one of the biggest problems I find with recycling. Yeah. One, availability. And B, how different it is everywhere based on funding and what facilities these councils or jurisdictions have. It's Yeah, it's really difficult, especially moving into state. We hardly ever see any recycle bins around, do we, in Queensland? It's really shocking because... But I feel like Victoria had them everywhere. It was yeah. just hand in hand. Yeah. You didn't have or, one without yeah, the other. That's right. That's how I grew up. I'm mm. like, oh, there's a bin over there. There's got to be a recycling bin right next yes. to it. And I, I was programmed like that being there for many years. You get here and it's like, bin, oh, I'll just walk to the next section, bin. There's no, And I'm just like, what the hell? I've just walked like four bins and yeah. none of them were recycling. It's like the campground we went to the other day and mm. there was five bins next to each other, not all general waste. And and some in my mind, I'm like, maybe Queensland like goes through them. Well, I'm, that's what we always hoped, isn't but, it? Yeah, but it's Who never. Who knows? Mm. Who knows if that's true? Yeah. But yeah, I just really, I needed to get that off my chest. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> How ridiculous. It's super ridiculous. Actually, that is a really good point that is going to put me on a bit of a tangent. Mm. I posted up on Instagram and a lot of people really loved it. And that's the dangers of wish, wish cycling. Wish cycling. Wish cycling. You see that post? I mustn't have. It's um essentially, I forgot the other term they use for it, but it's like, oh, when you look at something, this may or may not be recycling. I'll just put it in recycling anyway. And what that actually did, and the UK did a study on it, is it actually contaminated a whole, um, usually a truck will take a whole street and that contaminated that whole street's worth of recycling. A whole street. Yeah. So they assume. Because of one thing. Yeah. So if it's got like a lot of food or food scraps, it's going to go everywhere. And the recycling facility, they just don't have the time to clean it, sanitize it, etc. And so the, the headline around this whole study and thought was, can you recycle a pizza box? Yeah. Because amidst the, the crisis, the COVID crisis, a lot of people were getting pizza takeaway, right? Love Fine. Pizza. Um, but they were like, do I recycle this box? Or like, they were just questioning, there's a bit of cheese on it. And the premise is, yes, you can recycle it. If there's a bit of like oil or whatever, mm -hmm. that's fine. Just make sure there's no food. But what came from that is recycling ministers finding that a lot of people just don't know what to do. And there was actually a study with Australians, um, and I don't have it on me at the moment, but it was about 30% of Australians don't actually know what to recycle. And that, that's fine because, like we said, every, it's all complicated. Mm. But the point of what I'm saying is if you're in doubt, don't risk it. Don't risk contaminating the whole street. If that means you're not recycling this one object, that's going to be better than not being able to recycle one to 200 things because you weren't sure. Yeah. Well, remember one night, I think we spent a whole night mm. trying to figure out recycling and composting. Remember that? And biodegradable. Like, yes. Because biodegradable is also a different category and each category has got its own grading um it's and Australia so has difficult its, own it's like we are very eco-conscious and we like when we say a whole night i'm kidding you not oh, laptops on our laps or table and, and our phones hours. like we were just going like, from one to the yeah, other yeah, yeah. our phone in one hand double checking the information like it is immensely difficult and that's so sad it really is it just should be so easy Mm, which is why I never judge anyone if they don't know. No. Like, join the club. Like, nobody really knows. But just don't wish cycle. If you're not sure, throw it in the bin. Well, I did see that post because I um, – with pizza boxes, because they're cardboard, they can actually go in the green waste as well. Yeah. Even with the oil. They can. They can go in the green waste bin. Um, paper and cardboard make mm. great compost. Uh, actually, a lot of people, if you have, like, a garden in the back, so they put newspaper down, it actually um, – Stops the weeds yeah, right. from growing. And, and weed, obviously, I, I don't want to discriminate against weed. There's no, no such thing as like a weed. Um, weeds are just plants that we don't want or, or we think is not ideal. But it does um, stop the weeds from growing or the plants that you don't want growing. And it actually fosters more worms. I don't know if I believe the whole weeding thing. Because even weed, like weed Those nets, weed they still come through. And yeah. they're designed for well, that. Well, it's, it's meant to do that because yeah. it puts some pressure. It depends on how much layers you have and right. whatnot but yeah but more worms excellent that's great absolutely excellent so more on australia please western australia which we haven't been to yet have we no i haven't been to f s a w a <laughs> one of them 
<laughs> I haven't been to WA yet. Now has 2 million hectares of native forests protected. 2 million hectares. Can you even fathom how big that is? That's incredibly huge. Incredibly huge. One we should actually one point eight acres. Like it is two million hectares. That'd be what country? Yeah, that's is, what I was searching. Is about that what you're searching? At. What country is two million hectares? Because that is, oh, that is. If I were to guess right now, okay, I would oh. say like maybe Slovakia. Really? Yeah. I can't even picture how big Slovakia is. What country? Just a random guess, really is two well it's a very big state isn't it yeah it is a big state sorry for those by the way there's a lot of cars we're not that far away from the freeway so there's uh still cars you will hear oh colombia that is huge massive that that's bigger than slovakia that is bigger than chile and they're protecting that yeah how are they? Do Bigger you know than how? Azerbaijan. I don't have context. <laughs> what do you know? Any other Bigger than New Zealand. Not, okay. I don't have a lot. I don't have a lot. New Zealand is huge. Huge. I guess when we're looking at WA and is what it, it entails, yeah. there's look, there's Perth, there's Broome, Broome, and that's like little towns in between. Yeah. And it's the Kimberleys, of course. Yeah. Up north. They've, they've probably protected everything that's not a major city incredibly huge amount um but yeah there, there's going to be no more logging there whatsoever which is just fantastic i'm very very pleased to hear that can i follow it with a bad news story please new south wales holds our largest remaining native forest oh no New South Wales is no good at this stuff. And it will be the site of a gas project that has been fast-tracked by the Scott Morrison government. Oh. So, Face palm. Not to confuse anyone, WA has protected 2 million hectares of native forest, not exactly all in the one forest, yeah. so multiple, multiple forests. forests. Cool. So this is our last, our sorry, our largest remaining native forest. And it's going to be a gas site. Yeah. Well, New South Wales is a pretty, pretty bad state in terms of government environmental regulations. Is it? Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's pretty. WA? Bad. No. You said, stuff. Sorry, you said WA. Sorry, no, no, definitely New South Wales. Yeah. It's so bad. Oh, for sure. It's a, I don't want to say it, but. Yeah, it's run government. by. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, it's run by people who don't exactly prioritise the environment and see the value in preserving it. What did John want to do? He wanted to turn the, was it the Blue Mountains into uh, a theme park? Mount Kosciuszko, is that? Oh, the biggest mountain in Australia. Yeah, the biggest mountain in Australia who wanted to confer, convert that into a private um kind of wealthy people only theme park to just obviously seclude wealthy people alone and not have access to anyone else and the same with the hot springs over there mm. so they were going to close off the hot springs I this think, is just natural hot springs yeah, just and, that you could drive up to he said the hot springs <laughs> i can almost quote him the hot springs weren't hot enough so they're destroying the hot springs and putting in man-made hot springs with boilers systems. It's like, what? Yeah. So. Yeah. New South Wales, not yeah. so good. Come on, guys. Um, such a beautiful state. Such Stunning. a lovely state. Beautiful cities, beautiful towns. It's just a shame that the government has its priorities elsewhere. Mm. I've actually got another morbid story. Okay. This one's uh, got a bit of death involved, but um, hundred and twenty thousand healthy yeah, healthy pigs are being slaughtered for no reason other than having not enough workers to send them to an abattoir. So these pigs are having to be killed on a farm, and because they aren't slaughtered in a registered abattoir, like they're any more hygienic or ethical, which <laughs> they're not, it's not fit for food consumption. 
So they're getting used for biofuel and animal feed. And this is actually largely, largely due to Brexit and essentially not having international workers who would do this for them. Um, so that really, to me, just goes to show how f few people are actually willing to do that area of work. Like It is not pleasant. No. It's also for um, lack of butchers as well, which was what I was diving into. And was it – were we watching a – YouTube video on butchers the other day, or was it just me? yeah about the past? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So this, they were just this talking butcher about... from New Zealand, this butcher from Scotland or, mm. or Ireland, that region of the world, and they kind of they're both butchers, and I think they just met each other that day or yeah. something, and they're just like they essentially got this pus from was it? Yeah, was it was just it? like a big. I don't know. I wouldn't even. I don't know, know what, what animal cut, it was or what cut. I think it's every animal, but they're right. like, yeah, we were just kind of. Push into it and this pus would just... Oh, it just looks like a big zit, really. And it oh, was disgusting. Next like level. A lava level zit. And yes. It, was, it just kept coming and it was just pus and garbage. And they're saying every day they had to do this. Like these, these are local day. butchers. All local day, butchers. every day. They had both local abattoirs and your big agra style businesses sending them animals and both of them having just as much. And they, I think there was something like 20 a day they did or, or more or something like that. I'll leave the video so linked common. in the in the show notes. I'll even while we're talking, I'll put it up in the middle here for those on YouTube, just so we can uh, gross everyone out here. Ugh. Yeah, so that was pretty yuck. Yeah, we, we, you do not blame people for not wanting to be in that industry. We met someone in Egypt who was in that industry. Do you remember? No, I didn't. No. Yeah, um, old man. Oh, yeah, 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 yep, the guy from WA. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And he said Lovely he would Lovely old man. Lo he says, no he way. Just, um, he worked in the industry, but he said that it was because he didn't get a good education and you yep. would just find people working there that were bottom of the barrel, couldn't find anything else. Yeah, he said like a lot of them were ex-prison inmates. Yeah. And we know the conditions are just horrific. Yeah, well, they people who work in abattoirs and slaughterhouses have high rates of PTSD. Um, Do not blame them. No, it's actually it's actually really sad how little they get looked after. Which I mean, wasn't there a stage where some companies were making them wear adult diapers? Nappies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was in the US. Was it horrendous? Yep, in South America, I believe. So it was, it was actually really, really bad. But don't think that's just there. No, it, you know we've what was it? Um, Dominion was a, a Victorian. Yeah. Um, do they wear, do they wear nappies? No, 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 just the conditions. Yeah. You yeah. know, you always the think. have ones in, in like Laverton, mm. Ballarat. Um, you, you just always think, yeah, no, this doesn't happen else. near here. Yeah. Like we've been driving around the Daintree and we've seen cows just on hills. and. Yeah, exactly what you picture. Yeah. Isn't it nice? The cows mm. are just living this free life, but that's not, they're not the cows that you're. No. You, no. So, so little of that is. Exported, like. Yeah, put into the supermarkets. Yeah. So, yeah, it does happen where you live, sadly, and it's just horrendous. It's pretty but Yeah, 120,000 pigs just because there's lack of work. Mm. It's horrid. Really bad. Do you have a good news story for us next? Nah, I've got a funny one, though. Oh, uh, funny one. Just the headline, just the headline. Right, you probably headline. saw it. Donald Trump refuses to go vegan over fears of losing brain cells. Did you not see I this? I did not see this. You're joking. But I don't think he has any more to lose. Correct. Yeah. I just wanted to put it out there and is, is that's really actually, all I needed to is say. It, is it, did you click into the headline? Did you give it that much I didn't work? want it to. I want to hear him say. Yeah. No, I think there's actually, there might be a video of it. Okay. I'll tell you what, <laughs> if I Google this right now and I find it, I will insert it into this podcast. Yeah. Video and audio. Do it. Are you going to look for it right now? No. Oh, later. Post-production. Okay. But yeah, I'm. there might be. I'm not sure. I just really wanted to put it out there because everyone goes straight to, well, what brain cells? That's and right. like, where have you been, Donald? Where have you been? <laughs> and now you come out and say this? Like, yeah, it's where funny. have you been? It's very funny. Anyway. We mentioned California earlier on. Mm. You know what else happened there this month? <gasps> Tell me. Oil spill. Again. Yeah. This one was a big boy. Um, 3,000 barrels worth of oil spilt off the coast of Huntington Beach, 
from an offshore rig. So they had dead fish and birds washing up on their shore. 13 square miles of an oil slick. I'll put the video up. It is. It was pretty hard to watch. It's it's very, very intense. Um, they don't know when exactly. I didn't look into this. and I think it was the start of the month when I saw it. They didn't know how exactly it had ruptured at the time. So it could have just been kept like continuously spilling for a it long time. It could have time. been slowly spilling for a long time, but then eventually just burst. Um, it's just crazy. But I wanted to mention, you know, there's oil spills happening all the time. Just, I think every time we've done a monthly paradigm, yes. I have brought up an oil spill. And it's been like a major one. Yeah. Not just. M- major ones. Yeah. Yeah. So we had like the eye of fire, which happened off the Gulf of Mexico, which is literally something out of like Pacific Rim or something. And we, we, these are happening all the time. Last month was Trinidad and Tobago, which was insane as well. And when we look at this stuff, I can imagine a lot of people would be like defeated, like, oh, I didn't do that. Mm. And you're right, I didn't. But you got to imagine for what purpose would they be, I guess, drilling for these fossil fuels. So as an individual action, try to stay away from plastic because then they plastic is made from petroleum. So that's something we can do immediately today, tomorrow, yesterday, is to stop using plastic, use alternatives. We've got our metal drink bottle here. Um, we, to store our fruit, it's all just in baskets, which is like a cotton. Yeah, I think it's organic cotton. 100% organic cotton. It's You don't need bags when you shop, these kinds of things. And also consider walking, biking, taking public transport. All these things will help lower the demand and then the governments can give as many subsidies as they want but if people aren't purchasing it it's going to be a dead end road so that's just a little thing i wanted to finish on after reading about the spill yeah that's i love hearing problems and then the solution with it Mm. because sometimes you just you do you feel so defeated you're like well i'm not purchasing yeah oil yeah so why would i need you know, we just don't know that we're purchasing it. So, yeah, yeah good exactly. One. Indirectly. Well, in the medical field, there has been a little breakthrough. Oh, I like breakthroughs. Mm, I don't know if you'll like this one. So, in the US, there was a procedure done. A, cons- uh, a surgeon conducted a transplant with a pig's kidney into a human. Yes. Have you heard about that? No, I haven't, but I do. I had heard that the pigs, some of the pigs' organs are possible yeah. to transplant. Well, they've tried it a few times, probably more than we would even know, mm-hmm. but this time it didn't reject it. So the human body didn't reject it, which means like they've worked on this kidney, it's genetically formed. They've done, you know, medical alterations to make sure it doesn't mm-hmm. reject. Um, it comes with no surprise that there is a shortage of organ donors, right? This is why they're like outsourcing it to animals. Does that surprise you at all? No. Nah. I feel like it's just a common thing. Like there's shortage of blood, there's shortage of this. So we need to look for other solutions. So of course there's controversy around it. What do you, how do you stand there? Um, it's hard because really what the question comes down to is what life is more valuable. Mm. And I'm, I'm not going to say that a pig's life is less valuable than a human's life. I think they are equal in a lot of rights. However, I'm optimistic that this works because if we can create literal animal flesh in a lab, We can also create animal livers, be that pig or human. So I think the actual ability and for us to know that this transplant is possible, I think there's ways that we can follow that road down, not not following that road down, be like, just kill more pigs, give that to humans, because we also don't know what that will be in terms of possible complications in the future. This is obviously relatively new. We don't know what that will be like in two years' time. What does yeah. that do to your lifespan? All these well, questions. Another thing to note, the, the human body that they moved it into was actually a brain dead yeah. 
person that was on life support. So as yep. soon as they were taken off life support, they were they were dead. Um, they their family just gave them permission to do this testing. They obviously tested over like three or four days, and mm. the kidney function went it, it improved. So you know it's great to see that. But yeah, it's um it's exactly what you said. They it, it's it's choosing between mm. one life and another, and it's yeah it's really sad. And, um, Peter really kicked up a stink about it, which you know. Fair enough. Yeah, their job to pick up. Yeah, exactly, about his stuff. exactly. And they, I think, came up with a really good solution. That. Oh yeah. Why? Why isn't this a thing, right? So, they have suggested for all of us to be automatically opted in for being organ donors. Mm-hmm. And if you don't want to, then you opt out. Yeah. I can vibe with that. Who Who would opt out unless they were, you know, I, I think there's some religions religion. that don't I was about allow to say that. Religions and stuff like that. Yeah. But, you know. I think I think we've opted in. Yeah, we but it's, to, it's such we a process. We have to go onto a website, enter our, our medical details, mm. and then yes, we become organ donors. We got sent the card and stuff like that. Okay, I don't remember getting the card. Yeah, I got the card. I stored it already. It's all safe. My card. Yeah. My okay. Because it was just kind of like, am I an organ donor? I don't remember. Mm. You know, but why wouldn't we just all be opted? Then we definitely wouldn't have a shortage of organs. Yeah. Yeah, definitely not. I think that's a great, I think that's a better solution than having to cull all these pigs for trial and error. Absolutely. Because the procedure is not going to work every time. I'm very much assuming. And then you've literally grown, grown in quotes, a life, which is the pig yes. just for its liver or whatever organ you wanted to harvest. And then. And we can imagine may, may how the work. life has been for that pig yeah. to be able to get it to full size for it to then fit into our bodies. Mm. It's just, it's not, it's not a pleasant I just feel like life. It's, it, it's, it's an alternative, but I wouldn't go so far as to say it's a solution. Yeah, I agree. So it is a way to get another liver. It is not a good or ethical way in any shape or form to get a liver. A liver. Yeah, I was just so impressed with that solution. But did you know that, that we've been using pigs for a long time? What do you mean? So like um, heart valves. A lot of heart valve replacements are with pigs. Really? Yeah. I I did not know that. Neither did I. Okay. So we are already using that. I do not know if they're genetically, like, I don't know anything like that. Mm. Um, I just know that we are using them for hearts, which is really sad because if you had a healthy vegan diet, you probably wouldn't need to replace your heart valve. So there's actually another new, really exciting field that I haven't looked at too much, but in the way of science, it's really, really exciting and it's got to do with agriculture. And I think we've seen some YouTube videos around it and Singapore's got some, because obviously their land is a bit scarce, vertical farms. Mm, Cool. So it's something that maybe people will have seen in a, like a futuristic looking documentary or seen like... Yeah, didn't we see it in, was it 2040? Yeah, it could have been in 2040. It's something that's very new and... I'm in the process of reading about it and I'll put up a few posts on Instagram kind of diving into the science and there has been a lot of data around it because it's been around for a little while now and it's really starting to get up in in kind of media and, and whatnot. I haven't looked into whether or not the greenwashing is really intense or, or whatever it may be, but essentially what vertical farms are is literally exactly what it sounds like. We're talking like big pillars that go up. It could be maybe two, three, four, five meters, whatever it Maybe it's in like this greenhouse type um, structure, but the biggest one, uh, well, a company in Worcester actually, yeah, Mm. was the first farm that will grow about 2 million heads of leafy greens a year in their little vertical farm structure. Now, the reason that's really cool is because the size of the land that they have, that yield of 2 million heads is actually four times more than any other, um, like, non-vertical farm could produce. Wow. That's a lot. It's a lot. And obviously, it's seasonal. Well, it's firstly eco because you're structuring up, Mm -hmm. so using less land. That's obviously really good for everything. Using less pesticides because it's in a greenhouse situation and you're using less water 
because you're creating essentially an ecosystem and you could also make it quite um, seasonal. So for these guys in particular, they grew leafy greens. And then when that wasn't in season, they just switched to the strawberries. Mm, great. So they so have also not monocropping. Correct. That's great. So they have a year round use for this greenhouse type of structure, not using that much land, not using less water. I think it's a really cool potential solution for places like Nevada, the Australian desert, a lot of places where land is scarce. Singapore, Hong yeah. Kong, these kind of places can create their own ecosystem. Yeah. I have a question about it though. So we know that stress on plants mm -hmm. give it more polyphenols, which are really healthy for us to digest. Yeah. Of course, they're not going to have that because they're under perfect conditions. Correct. So we're still going to have to eat or like normally grown on, you know, outdoor Correct. food. So it's not a complete solution, but it, it's, it's, it's a, a, it's a step because it's just less land. Mm. Um, obviously I would always, maybe there's a way to make it organic. Yeah. I'm not sure whether this would even affect the polyphenols. Yeah. It, it could be just as much of a polyphenol, but the fact that it has less pesticides, which we know affects oh, our, in, our fertility rates. We know it affects, um, obviously in the amount that we consume, it generally is quite harmless, but it can have some effects that we shouldn't ignore. Um, so it definitely would, I wouldn't pin it as a final solution, but I'd say it's a really nice innovation that can come in handy in certain situations. Yeah. And of course the food is still healthy cause it's vegetables and yeah. it's fruit. It's just those, um, Poly polyphenols for longevity really, isn't it? Yeah, mm. correct. It's always like when compared to what. Yeah. If you're always eating a variety, I don't think it's something to be worried about. Yeah. Because I'd rather be eating a bunch of genetically modified organisms than eating non-genetically modified organisms, but it's crap. Yeah. I guess that's um, something we hope the future doesn't have to rely on. It's correct. It's just a, a stepping stone for those smaller countries that – you know, have to import everything and then greenhouse gases go up hugely anyway. Cool. Thanks. You're welcome. Well, on vegetables and all of those good things. Yep. I have a little story about mushrooms. Awesome. They still wouldn't make me eat them though. <laughs> We got a pizza, was it last night? Yeah. It was full of mushrooms. It was Heaven. like, <laughs> yeah, no, not for me. All right. There was a new study that shows that mushrooms have been found to benefit mental health mm -hmm. and lower risks of depression. I believe both those things. Yeah. We, we know a lot about the benefits of mushrooms. You've spoken to. Um... So it was Jeff Chilton yes. and. Tommy Moore, both Tommy on the show. Moore, of course. I don't know if we touched on mushrooms as much with Tommy, but Jeff Chilton is the presidency of Namex, I believe, and Real Food Mushrooms. So they... He was very knowledgeable. Super knowledgeable on mushrooms. If you guys like mushrooms, definitely listen to that episode. Yeah. Um, yeah. They are really, really helpful. And using things like adaptogens, um, so things like reishi, chaga, ashwagandha, Lion's mane, all these different mushrooms that have really, really good effects on your body. And they all do different things. So you can kind of cater it almost like a Chinese herb way, but mm. just using natural organic mushrooms. So the reason that it does lower your risks of depression mm -hmm. is because mushrooms contain ergothionine. Ergothionine. Yes. I said it, didn't I? Yeah, you said that But I right. said it very slowly. Just very slowly. <laughs> sounding it out. Which is an antioxidant mm -hmm. that may protect against tissue damage in the body. Yeah. So according to Science Daily, the study shows that antioxidants such as this help prevent several mental illnesses. That includes schizophrenia, bipolar, and depression. Awesome. It's, it's in really early stages of you know, developing this study. Um, 
they admitted there are some limitations and of course that's because there's so many different mushrooms there's just you can't just say mushrooms lower depression rates no you can't it, there's so many so i'm sure there's you know the studies are going into that but of course it is very early days um and there's that that, that um netflix yeah, fungi is it called? Fantastic fungi? fungi. Yeah, you did want to watch it. I did want to watch it. Thank goodness. Yeah, you know it looks it looks amazing, and mushrooms is something of the future. Like someone else we had on the show um, started his own company, Libre Foods, I think they're called, which is making they made meat out of the mycelium of mushrooms, which yeah. is essentially the root system underneath the stem of the mushroom. So that can span, from what I know, forever until it comes across concrete or something where the soil stops. And the mycelium has this really fibrous texture. So they made, you can make meat products out of it. Like if we look at Fable, it's, yeah. that's, I think they use like shiitake or something like that. And they do. The, the fiber in mushrooms is incredibly interesting um, and a really cool f- uh, solution and the way that our future of the food will go. And like, I like Fable where I don't really like mushrooms. So yeah, there, there is hope still. Yeah. Um, more on mushrooms though there was a fantastic fungi global summit whoa this month yep it was a two-day event it was set up to advocate for the wealth of benefit the wealth of benefits for mushrooms Mm -hmm. um for improved mental health well-being and the easing of pain so they've obviously looked into mushrooms easing pain and everything um but yeah that that super interesting not that I care about mushrooms too much, but. That's awesome. Mm. Really cool stuff. Mushrooms are great, honestly. I had Four Sigmatic for months. You did, yeah. And I love Four Sigmatic. Um, I think the mushroom in Four Sigmatic is a little bit weak, um, obviously, because mushrooms are bitter. You know, yeah. they have certain textures and what they've done. It needs to be enjoyable to. Yeah, so okay. what they've done with Four Sigmatic is add things like, um, generally, they're, they're pretty healthy, they're organic, mm. but they add like cinnamon, I think like nutmeg. Ew, ew. So you, <laughs> you can't really taste the mushroom, but it is quite nice. Like their lion's mane. Not that we're affiliated with them, but I actually really enjoyed their product. Mm. If you like, they had like mushroom hot chalk. They had um, the coffee. They had heaps of things going they on. They did. Yeah. You spent a lot at yeah. one stage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was spending, it wasn't too much, maybe 30, 40 bucks a month on their products. Yeah, the only mushrooms I'm taking at the moment is, is it Nootropic, Neurotech, Neurotech maybe? Um, they're a local Brisbane-based company. I take their like hot chalk sometimes at night. Mm. Just one serving of that is really meant to have you deep, have, I guess, let you have a deep sleep, which is quite nice. But yeah, I recommend people trying out different forms and just seeing how that works for them. So cool. Yeah. What else you got for us? Well, we did watch a documentary this month. We did. So we got early access to the amazing Eating Our Way to Extinction. Um, incredible, incredible documentary. What was your thoughts on the on the doco as a whole? I really liked it. I thought it wasn't just like a lot of the times I'll come away with, you know, who's even going to watch this? And I think by the title, it will turn a lot of people off. Um, and like we discussed, we think it's for more plant curious people Mm. that would be more interested in watching it. But I think the actual documentary itself is really targeted to a wider, like wider variety of people because they really didn't say stop eating meat. It was a lot of reduce, reduce, reduce. Mm. They definitely mentioned... They mentioned plant based a few times. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I thought it, I thought it was really bang on. What I really like about what they said in there it really resonated with me. It's climate science, and this is exactly what we're talking about. The Great Barrier Reef. Climate science is conservative, mm. and we'll go into a bit more about another example of a real life example of that when we're talking about COP twenty six. But it is conservative. You think we're like exaggerating all this stuff, but no, it is the exact opposite. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was a really good documentary. I would watch it again. Yeah, I think I think I'll watch it again too. It is it is really, really good. So for those 
who have a chance when it does come out on whatever platforms it is released on. Um, highly, highly recommend watching that with friends, with family, especially if you are plant curious or you want to learn more about the environment. Um, it is incredibly uh, insightful. Yeah. And the way that it's done is just really, really well. And they touched on a lot. So health, oh, so environment, much. you know. So it's not just honing in on one thing. It was it was really diving into all of them. You know, they touched on that. Um, <laughs> it's just so funny. And we were talking about this yesterday and you brought it up while I was driving. Racism. Oh, yeah. So for those who don't know, there is a very big um, – influencer slash author slash carnival advocate um is she carnival i believe so um or at least majority it's a sustainable dish on instagram and we went back and forth with a few dms because i called her out because she said eating more um red meat. red meat would actually kill less animals than eating plants and that was just atrocious it was very poorly worded. There was absolutely no citation, no source at all. And she wouldn't even provide you one. She wouldn't even provide one. She kept saying, buy my book, buy my book. <laughs> so I reckon she said it twice yeah. or three times in a few message um, interactions. And I found it really interesting because the, deven- the defense mechanisms, and you know, I might read her book, I might not, but I'm not close to different perspectives. But I'm just fascinating with fascinated with the defense mechanisms used. So when it was with her, she actually called me a racist for recommending and talking about a vegan diet. Mm. And I'm thinking, when I first read that top part, I'm like, racist? What in the world are you talking about? And then she said, you can't expect tribes like the Inuit to go vegan. And I'm like, if you listening to this podcast right now, are a tribes member in the Inuit or something else tribe, I don't think a lot of what we're talking about relates to you or your life. Absolutely not. You are probably, your carbon footprint is probably tiny, much smaller than ours. Definitely. And your consumption as a whole is much smaller. I'm not talking to a tribe, like... No. No. We're talking to the everyday person that is buying meat from the supermarket, which comes from a factory farm. Why, like, and I was called a racist. I, I don't, I, know. I don't know if I even responded to that message. Uh, like, I think, <laughs> I don't know if I did. I was just, I was just flabbergasted. I was just, racist. It really got under my skin a lot, didn't it? Like, yeah. I just, it, it really threw you off because, well, why did it get under your skin? Well, today was it today or yesterday? I, I, I was thinking about it, and in the um, eating our way to extinction. It literally showed us how Indigenous people are being kicked out of their own rainforests. Mm. And that is purely to grow soy to feed cows. And the Indigenous know this. They know. They say it in the film. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess the part that's really frustrating me is that we're trying to preserve their way of life. Yeah. We agree with their way of life. If we lived off the land, I'm sure we would eat a fish. I would try not to. I would I would probably stick to my bananas and other fruit and veggies. Yeah, okay. That's but fair. it's 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 besides the point. We're not talking to people who don't have access to internet, who consume stupid amounts of food, who use a lot of single use products, who live in a modern Western society. Who has the biggest carbon footprint? Freaking Australians per capita. Mm-hmm. We don't live in tribes. So if we did, we'd we'd be better off. Yeah, we'd be much better off. And there would be less animal deaths in tribes. Like Absolutely. these people. They consume, go hunting once a day. And not eating three animals every different animal for every meal. Absolutely. It was just, it just baffled me. It was I just know. such a weird I had never been called a racist before for recommend like, I just, I, I don't know. What was the other point that I came up with the other day? I have, I can't remember. Mm, can't remember either. It was, yeah, it was, it's just strange being called, like, it's just not how it works. And, and just to touch on the, you know, vegans aren't honest or perfect because they still kill animals. I actually did a really big post on this and I, it took me maybe five or six hours to make this carousel because I wanted to find out for sure 
do vegans actually kill more animals? And when we're looking at the best estimates, so we looked at in Australia, a lot of the time we're actually killing rodents to grow crops. Um, especially we have like mouse plagues in like South Australia, they get really bad. Um, and so when we're looking at estimates of avian fish from like, um, livestock runoff from fertilizer actually kills a lot of fish, uh, avian deaths from that as well. Um, rodent kills. So in America, this could be squirrels here. We've got possums, rats, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so all these deaths combined and I run, ran the best possible estimates, which was done by a group of researchers. It was done by USDA and the EPA. So I combined all the calculations from these uh, three sources and it put me at seven, I think it was 7.6 billion deaths arise from plant agriculture. It's a lot. 7.6 billion. It's a lot. That's just in the US. And in the US alone, 9 billion chickens are slaughtered. Just chickens. No other animal, not cow, not pig, not sheep. No other animal, just chickens. So this motion, and actually I haven't even finished, in the US in particular, and you can find this on USDA, their actual website, 80% of all grain grown that result in the majority of these deaths go to the cows. So not only is that 7.6 billion plants, but it's actually fed to the animals in majority. So this is why it just blew my mind. There is no chance you can convince me or show me relative science and a good source that suggests that vegans kill more animals than people who eat meat. But also, if we're not eating plants, what are we supposed to eat? The air. <laughs> meat. Because if you don't eat plants, just eat more meat. Eat all meat. Eat carnival diet. We'll all not live very long. Yeah. <laughs> Average life expectancy plummets. How is that for a headline? Do you want another story for us? That was my rant over. Yeah. That that really pissed me off. Yeah. Let's talk about Nestle. All right. Let's do it. We've been hearing a lot about Nestle in the last mm. what, few weeks, yeah. few months even. Yeah. Especially with the big Kit Kat movement yeah. coming out. Um. I thought I'd do a little bit of digging and I read an opinion piece on on um, Nestle. Their conclusion was Nestle has shown time and time again that they have very few ethics and little interest in the real social responsibility. From promoting their formula to uneducated African women to lying about production dates, to using water without a permit. They've often gone the extra mile to make an extra profit, even when the extra mile meant hurting people, directly or indirectly. I didn't know a lot about Nestle's background, um, but in this article, they went as far back as 1911. Wow. Yeah. And that was about the baby formula that I mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. Nestle left cities dried up or left them with contaminated water because they are the biggest bottled water company in the world. And that was leaving cities in like Pakistan, which already has poor water, yep. completely contaminated. It, you just, the water was no longer drinkable. And that's not even mentioning the, um, oh, actually, as well, speaking of water, they were also using water reserves from Flint, Michigan. What? Flint, Michigan. Yeah, right. That's how bad this is. We know how bad their water mm. situation is. Is and that, I wonder if that's why, I think it's Nestle that deliver bottled water every day to them. They must be guilt. Must be. Must be serious guilt. But that's not even mentioning like the child labor, the abuse, the trafficking that was also mentioned as late as 2009. Right. So I know they got a new CEO in 2017. And since then, we've been hearing good things. They've been bringing out plant-based options. Yep. Um, the Kit Kat, the, the, I think, is a new shrimp that they've brought out. 
and they are trying to reduce their greenhouse emissions. That's not the only reason they're actually going in a plant-based direction. Can you guess why? Money. Mm, yeah. yeah. So they're predicting that, you know, plant-based is going to be on the rise and they will, they're foreseeing about what oh, companies going up about 400%. So they want, numbers, yeah. they want a pie of that. So this is something that the new CEO said. We think less meat and dairy is good for the planet, but it's also good for diet and health. And it is also a big commercial opportunity. So he's aware that these mm. are all factors. Yes, it's a good thing for people's health. It's great for the environment and also for our pockets. So I don't know. I don't I, think that's a bad thing. No, of course not. I think of that's... Of course not. Every company wants to be profitable. Correct. I just... It's so sad that it has been at the misfortune of mm. so many people. And for so many years. And I I really didn't even dive into a lot of it. Like the yeah, baby formula, that like... really tweaked my interest for some reason. Um I, I don't love the company. The amount of plastic that they are producing is ridiculous. Mm. So it's just I, I can never really be on the level with that company. Yeah. Um, but it is nice to hear that they are caring, even if it's just for their own pockets reason, Yeah. about the environment. Yeah, I'll take it. Um, but obviously, we, we appreciate every step, but we understand the bigger the company, the bigger the responsibility. Mm. Did you also know that they're the biggest production producer of dairy in the world? I had no idea about that. Me neither. Like zero idea. I guess they're just such a big umbrella company. Huge. Yeah, we would have no idea. I'd be not surprised if they had like hotels. <laughs> so I want to touch on something that's um, pretty cool. And I know we're running, it's a bit of a longer episode, about an hour and a half in now. So um, I want to talk about a really big topic but i shouldn't spend too much time on it um that's cop 26 mm. um i did a few hours of research on it today and i thought i should probably touch on it because it's probably on everyone's mind it's starting well now probably um, uk time probably mm. starting right about now entry times it goes for about two weeks and i just wanted to give a rundown of what exactly it is yeah well some people might not know what it is so yeah but, which is completely fair you know especially now every few months you might hear cop 26 um, so for nearly three decades, the UN has been bringing together almost every country for global summits called COPS, which stands for Conference of the Parties. So in that time, within a few decades, climate change has gone from being a fringe issue to a global priority. And this year will be the 26th annual summit, given the name COP26. So you've probably heard of the Paris Agreement, which was signed in 2015. Um, in that agreement, countries had to commit to providing national measures to cut down their carbon emissions. And those targets were called Nationally Determined Contributions, or NDCs. Now, has the Paris Agreement worked? No, not really. And they honestly knew it wouldn't. They actually put a mechanism in the document of the agreement that countries signed to say that there has to be a meeting every five years to update measures based on recent evidence and how the country is going. So the commitment laid out in Paris did not come close to limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees. And the window for achieving this is obviously closing every single minute. Now, the decade after 2030 will be crucial. And as momentous as Paris was, countries must go further to keep the hope of holding temperatures rates to under five point, uh, sorry, 1.5 degrees. That's right. So they actually figured out that if we followed the Paris Agreement, we would actually result in a three degree Celsius of warming, which is which would obviously, as we can assume, disastrous. No, like no human life on this planet. Now, the current NDCs including those that have been newly submitted or revised by the US, the EU, and the UK, and more than 100 others are still inadequate. So more than 100 other nations have got NDCs that will lead us towards disaster. In fact, if we followed the NDCs currently, it would result in a 16% increase 
in emissions as opposed to the promise of a 45% cut. So it's definitely going the wrong way. So COP26 is incredibly important. It's a way to correct these, this course that's not going the right way. It's, it's taken a turn for the worst from the Paris Agreement. So COP26 is there to make sure that it can get essentially turned in the right direction. So there's a lot of good news and a lot of bad news with, with COP. Obviously, when we're looking at the big emissions, countries like China, now the Chinese president, Xi Jinping, I can't pronounce his name, but Xi Jinping is actually not even going. So he wasn't going to go for a long time and now he's just he's doing a video call in. Mm. Um, that shows a lot of commitment. Shows heaps of commitment. And that's the worst thing because China, like not talking per capita, but as a nation, China is the largest in the middle. Um, so we... We, we want them to make huge change. So t China is actually a decade behind its 2060 target at the moment. <laughs> so on top of that, China has plans to increase its greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. So it's going just in the complete wrong direction. So a, a lot of these nations come, come there with different plans to reduce their emissions. So... A lot of countries are looking to electric vehicles. A lot of countries are looking towards nuclear power, um, which is something I looked into a bit and I found it very confusing. So I need to have someone on the show who's, who's an expert in that field, but essentially it's just more energy produced in a smaller land. If you know anybody and have any suggestions. Yeah, for nuclear energy. Apparently it is a solution that France is looking at quite, quite significantly. Um, but reading up on... A lot of COP26 and a lot of the news that's going on. Some journalists really had me on edge reading this stuff. It was just, it was just hilarious. I was reading this random paper. I think it was called, it was Japan Forward. That was the name of this um, paper. And I put this in quotes: <laughs> Western countries are working harder toward decarbonization, but the motive is not just to prevent global warming. If anything, it is an energy energy shift away from fossil fuels and an attempt to become a stronger world power through a new industrial revolution, end quote. So I read that and I thought, so you're essentially wording this and phrasing this in a way that says, if you want to reduce your carbon emissions, you are power hungry, insensitive, and you just want to monetize on a new revolution so you have power over other nations. And I just thought it was a very interesting piece of journalism. What a perspective. I just, I don't know how you can think like that. Hmm. Hey, you're leaning towards green energy. You just want to be the best of the best. Like that was the perspective of this journalist. So I just, I just found that really interesting. But yeah, that's good old Japan. Japan was on one of the lists that actually is trying to go against the IPCC. Right. Right. So a few countries, like there was a leaked document, which was, they're releasing a new, I guess, uh, edition of the IPCC report. And there was a leaked document that Greenpeace uncovered, which includes tens of thousands of comments, um, including some pretty stupid things from our good old Morrison government that rejected the findings in the IPCC report that coal needs to be phased out. Now, again, this wasn't Australia. This was a group of companies, a group of countries. I could refer to them as companies. You could. Um, it, it just pretty much means that this government is tied to fossil fuels and, yeah. and other ones like... They're in their pocket, not the other way around. The government is in their pocket. Yeah. And they're stuck. Another country that really didn't like the IPCC report is Brazil. Um, obviously, because the report mentioned being plant-based, yep. Brazil being one of the largest exporters of cattle. So a lot of this COP26 is, is really one of the last straws to try to make us lean towards a good direction. I really hope it puts some perspective, like mm. shifts in some of the leaders of the world. And did we find out if they're going with a plant-based? I actually didn't find out. Ugh. 
No, we'll have to. Well, you know what? We'll find out soon. They might have promised it, but it might not happen. Mm. So the talk actually happens on the 12th of November. There's chats in between. So for the next monthly paradigm, we'll make sure to do some research on that yep. one. Find out for everyone. Definitely. Yeah, it's really exciting, COP26. I'm, I'm, I'm more excited than I am cynical for this. Yeah, I think it's, it's bringing so much awareness around. It's serious. It's it go is. time. Yeah. Something needs to happen and it's almost too late. Mm. So yeah. yeah, it's about bloody time. Yeah, I'm I'm really, really excited. And if the time frame works, time zone works out, I'd love to watch the actual talk, but I'm not staying up late <laughs> for it. So I hope it works out. Um, well, I'm yeah. sure it'll be. Mm. You can watch it. saw her on Instagram, Gret, I just got there. Oh, nice. Yeah, go do your thing. What a superstar. I've got a sustainability tip for us. Yes. Love okay. these. So it is very related to us right now. So, and I think, I don't think we're always living through this, mm -hmm. but we plan to in the future. Mm -hmm. That is for certain. So travel, it's something that we'll never stop doing no. as a race, as a couple, th this is just something that won't happen. You, yeah. We will never stop. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean we don't care about the environment. Like, you know, you hear pushback from people. Getting on a plane is so many greenhouse gases. Yeah. You hear it all the time. But that that that's not the case for us. We obviously care about the environment. But we pick and choose what is important to us and we help where we can. So we are working towards building a life that will allow us to slow travel. And slow travel is a sustainable way of traveling. I looked up the definition today, actually. Oh, yeah? It, I really connected with it. Shoot. Slow travel is an approach to travel that emphasizes connection to local mm. people, to cultures, to food, and to music. It relies on the idea that a trip is meant to educate and have an emotional impact in the present moment and for the future, while remaining sustainable for local communities and the environment. Yeah, I really, really like that. And I think, you know, I think that'll resonate with a lot of people. Oh, for sure. Definitely. So... Essentially, slow travel is just immersing yourself into one place and, you know, not having to drive on, you know, next day, next day, next day. Really immersing yourself, you know. If you are looking at flying somewhere, try and spend those extra few days there so you're not having all of this emissions over mm. just one holiday. And another great way to travel sustainably Something that you so kindly got me for my birthday. Do you want to elaborate? Are you talking about the carbon neutrality? Yeah. Yeah. So this is one of um, Shana's presents for her birthday. And that was me making our trip carbon neutral, um, carbon negative or, or positive yeah. even. Um, don't know what the term is. But last month we talked about Orca, which was the machine built in the Scandinavian region and essentially it's a it's the biggest of its kind and it sequesters carbon by pulling in carbon from the atmosphere um i think it compresses it and then it drills it down into the earth and there it solidifies and i think it can uh, put down 4000 tons of carbon a year so that's it is an incredible right. device a um, bit expensive to build and run but that's what people like us are for so i actually uh well it has on their website ways to um make yourself carbon neutral and it says how, what you're doing so you could say i travel for a year i travel for three months or, or what you're doing you can do it based on subscription or a one-off and so i paid enough for us to travel for three months completely carbon positive or, or neutral whatever the term is but um it was it was really cool way and it actually has a feature to give it give it as a gift so the way it worked with sean is i scheduled the email at a particular date and time for for her to get that email um and it says like your name you can write a little thing so i really like that as a really unique gift um, of course it is tax deductible which is how good is that um but if you feel guilty about it 
just put $30 in and it actually tells you how much kilograms of CO2 that would have actually sequestered. That's so cool. Which is really cool. So you're actually helping literally, like, you know how sometimes when you tick that little box when you're booking a flight, you don't know what that's doing? Yeah. It's, if you really want something, like this actually says, this is how much this machine will sequester with your funds. Yeah, that's really good. Really cool. Yeah, I really appreciated that. It was a very nice gift. Yeah, if you have eco-friendly people, mm. that's a um, great gift. Yeah. So, yes, slow travel is the sustainable tip of the month. Thanks. Do you have any other big stories besides good news? No. All right. I'm ready. It is getting sweaty in here. Oh. It is like hot. Like it's probably maybe maybe 30, maybe 29 outside, but it is maybe 32 in here. Um, and even the bugs in here are sweating. <laughs> so we're going to find a way to clear them out as well before we go to sleep. But mm -hmm. are we ready for the good news? We'd love to finish on good news. Um, it is a nice way to end a podcast episode where sometimes we do talk about a lot of maybe morbid things. Um, not today. I feel like today has been mm. more, a lot really positive. Yeah. Which is awesome. Um, so I want to kick it off actually. So usually I get you to kick it okay. off and we're in a camper van yes. that runs off solar, but imagine everything was solar. Imagine everything was electric. Imagine we didn't have to fill up fuel. It is a thing. Actually students invented Students from Eindhoven University in the Netherlands built a solar-powered camper that's fully electric. Now, we're talking 22 students built this in one year. Built superstars. Yeah. It's called the Stella Vita. And I'll put up a photo in the middle here. It looks pretty freaking cool. Um, it's designed for two passengers, has a kitchen, sitting area, bed, shower, toilet, and it uses solar energy alone. The vehicle can come up, cover up to 450 miles on a sunny day reaching a top speed of 75 miles, 75 miles per hour, which is just over 100, as well as powering all the inside amenities, a TV and a laptop. Crazy. Um, one of the students was interviewed and he actually said, the technology is there, we just have to change the way we think. I love that quote. Now, on a cloudy day, which is what a lot of people might be thinking, the vehicle can still produce 60 to 70% of the energy. And even if there is no sun at all, you can still have an efficient, normal electric car that can charge from a charging port. Really cool. Mm. This reminds me of the politician in Australia that's against, I forgot his name, he's against solar energy. And he says, we don't want energy that is scared of a cloud or something yeah. like something along those lines. I'm just like, it's, that's just, that's, come on, mate. Um, so how cool is that? That's really cool. Yeah. So in the, and it looks really cool. I just I, think uh, if it came to Australia, we'd have that huge tax on it. <laughs> oh, humongous tax on it. Um, and, you know, one of the other quotes one of the students said was, if this is what students can do, imagine what companies can do. Yeah, that's the... Uh, 22 students in one year. That's the bizarre thing, isn't it? Who's paying who to be quiet? Pretty, I'm really stoked that people out there, that's the next generation. Yeah. You know? Well done, guys. Your turn. All right. I really struggled with the good news stories this month, to be honest. Really? Because everything was good news. Yeah, I feel like it kind of was. Okay. But I feel like these two probably the only ones that qualified for good news stories. Mm -hmm. So, Burger King opened a fully vegetarian restaurant in Madrid. Did you see that? I did see that. How cool is that? That's very, very cool. And they rebranded it as Burger King. It's very, very cool. Um, and... I, the first thing that comes to my mind is vegans can't make a difference. Mm. You know what I mean? Like that is literally like what a shift, like, and this for them might just be a trial. Can yeah. they switch? You know, you don't, I don't know what the CEO is thinking or whatever it is, but I'm thinking this is a world of opportunity. Yeah. It is a limited time thing. So it's more like a pop-up store. Yeah. Um, and they've, They've partnered with the vegan, uh, the sorry, the vegetarian butcher, which is a Dutch, awesome. yeah, a Dutch vegetarian and vegan meat brand. Mm. Um, the idea was to reach those who already have a vegetarian diet, but are also are. Uh, it, it's to help reduce the meat consumption of others. Um, so it, what it did have its you know head in the right place, and I think they did a pop up also in Cologne, so it must have worked. For them to do another one. Or they maybe didn't work and they're testing another population. Don't know. Nah, I'm not going with that. 
No. This is a good news story okay. segment. Yeah. It worked. Okay. So they're doing it in Madrid. Yeah. Mm. Very cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Good on you, really Burger cool. King. Like Again, Burger King was one of the people in the studies. Yeah. So I'm excited about the change. Like if you're going to eat crap, at least make it more carbon neutral. Mm-hmm. But we don't endorse eating that. I can't even say that. I hope we never endorse eating that kind of stuff. But for the environment. It's just never going to not be a yeah, part it's never of people's gonna be not, diets. That's right. So eat your less, less evil. Yeah. Correct. Cool. Very cool. Well, speaking of plastics, I guess what I brought up of plastics in the... I wasn't speaking of plastics. In the plastics in the study. Russia, of all bloody countries, is set to ban single-use plastics. Really? Not in 2030. Not in 2050. Tell us. 2024. Wow. Good one. We're talking three years away. Great. Like, you know, you always... But again, hear... what does that mean? I'll tell you. Tell me. Well, actually, the story is actually September 2nd. The head of the Ministry of Natural Resources of Russia, Alexander Kozlov, came out and said it is planned to finally ban the production of disposable goods and packaging, plastic packaging in Russia by 2024. Sorry. Is that the production? Did you just say production? Production, yeah, it is production, but it is production and use. Okay. So the list is disposable plastic tubes, plates, glasses, appliances, glass lids, coffee capsules, cotton swabs, opaque and colored PET bottles, which is thermoplastic polyester, boxes and packs of tobacco products, blister packaging, except for medicines, Packaging for chicken and quail eggs. Several types of bags, including doy pack, flow pack, jug shaped, sachet bag, like mesh bag for vegetables and fruits. That's a pretty comprehensive list. Yeah. And, that's in, and, and it's not going to be 2024 done. They're actually slowly phasing it out. Great. Now, I think, I, I'm not sure when the start will be, but I think he said the plants are slowly phasing them out. Excellent. That's awesome. Good on you, Russia. Dobre došli. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Yes, I respect the Russian people for that one. What's the next good news one? This is my last one. Okay. I've got two more. So okay. I can finish off. So you can, you can uh, finish I, I this can, up? Uh, yeah. TED Talk held an in-person cl- climate conference. I did see something about this, but I didn't click into it or anything. Yeah, okay. What is this? So it was called the Countdown Summit. Mm-hmm. And get this. Their menu was 100% vegan. Shut up. I'm so impressed. Can you believe it? I I, I, I can and I do, but I'm shocked <laughs> yeah. still. So the attendees were leaders in Edinburgh, Scotland. Yeah. Indigenous legi- leaders. Mm-hmm. Politicians, entrepreneurs, policymakers, scientists, artists, philanthropists, and young activists. I'm stoked. Yeah. That. Yeah. Um, there they discussed what needed to be done to protect and restore the planet. This included laying out a blueprint of for an attainable path to a net zero future. Cool. We can actually watch it. I think it was um yeah, put out Twitter. yesterday. Yeah. Cool. Um. So yeah, I would love to watch that. It'll yeah, it'll cool. show the highlights only. Mm-hmm. Um and for the rest of the year, hundreds of TEDx sorry, not TED, TEDx, mm-hmm. TEDx countdown events will be held to magnify these sustainability goals. Awesome. So, you know, just making sure that they're reaching each one and I guess kind of like retouching on goals like we do weekly. Cool. Same sort of thing. I love that. Um, The reason they held it as a fully plant-based menu is because studies show that reducing meat and dairy production and consumption is one of the most effective ways, or sorry, most effective actions we can take to avoid catastrophic climate change. I like how they added in catastrophic in there. Catastrophic. And this really shows that they're about taking action, not just Mm. having a chit-chat, let's... um, Let's make it look like we give a shit. That really shows that they care. Yeah. Good on you, Ted. I'm really happy about that. That is good news. Yeah. I think they really do good things as well. I like TEDx. Yeah. I, I don't know anything. I, I watch a lot of TEDx, um, generally about random topics, but I'm glad because there's, I can imagine there's so many more TEDx than TEDs. 
Yeah, I'd say so. Because there's so much more locally, yes. like a source community orientated. So that's yeah. really, really awesome. I think they're a lot more separate than we think as well. Ted and TEDx. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway. But yep. Good on them. Well, Google, another big company that does so many bad things, but does some some good things. Mm. And one of the good things they're doing is a new map option, which I told you about, which is lower carbon. So when you're actually routing, you can now have or soon have a low carbon option, and this will actually be the default. So motorists will be able to select a route with the lowest carbon emissions once factored in things such as traffic, road inclines as well. Wow. Yeah. So Google's chief executive, Sundar Pichai, said the initiative could save 1 million tons of carbon dioxide a year or the equivalent of taking 200,000 cars off the road. That's so cool. Mm. Yeah. I am really excited about that. Something you're doing anyway, you're driving. Yeah. Why not make it carbon neutral? I'm really interested to like look at our routes and mm. see How which... How would it differ? Yeah. Might be, you know, a lot of the times the same because it's oh, the fastest sure. route. Yeah. You know, so it's got to equate. And would you. I'd imagine freeways would be more carbon friendly. I, I, I would know. imagine just because you're going imagine. 100 and you're yeah. not using as much fuel. Yeah. Um, awesome, though. Yeah, really cool. That'd be fun to play around with. I've got a second one then to finish us off. Go for it. Denmark, good old Scandinavian region. They always do so good. They are making a huge stride, actually. $90 million worth. So a lot of the time we talk about how many, how much money um, agribusinesses make. But what about for the plant people? And that is where the money is going. So $90 million will be available for at least five years to farmers who produce plant-based foods. A fund of $11.7 million USD will be provided annually from 2022 to 2030 to support the plant-based transition of food. Oddly enough, big plant ag business got its way. Finally, the big plant, the big broccoli. Love that. Got its way. And that's so funny that you mentioned that because when we were on our Daintree tour, mm. when we were talking to that lovely Adelaide couple, they asked why we were vegan. And we said purely because of the rainforests and the environment, we want to sustain it. Mm. And the first thing that she said was, was um, what about the cattle farmers though? They've got no other option. Mm. And they do. They so, really do. They do. And look, not to say that it's not hard to oh, transition. It would be incredibly difficult. Absolutely. Um, but there are options out there. There are people that are helping and there are subsidies you can still get access to. Yep. Um, and a lot of the time you'll be much better off, especially your land. Um, but this actually came about because this is what Danish people want. Great. Um, so a survey was done and six out of 10 Danes agreed that Denmark should take the lead in terms of being the best are producing plant-based foods. And that is what needs to take place for this to happen. It's big funding. I think I do not understand how Denmark isn't the most livable place in the world. I'm, if I'm not, correct me if I'm wrong, I think they have free education, free health care. I have no idea. I'm almost certain that it's Denmark. Well, I'm very proud of you, Denmark. If you're listening to this show, things. Denmark, just remember <laughs> to leave a leave a review. I think that's it. Yeah. Good news, bad news, all the news. I'm very excited. This is our longest monthly paradigm. We're going for two hours now. Oh my gosh. I know. I hope we've entertained people and I hope you learned a lot. They sat through our voice for two hours. They should be so lucky. <laughs> well, thank you so much for listening to us. Um, we obviously do so love our hearts while we're sweating in here with a bug-filled room with a van that is potentially about to run out of solar. Um, with, uh, Yeah, that's life right now. Oh, my gosh. How good is that? Um, if you enjoyed the show, please leave a rating on Apple iTunes or whatever you're listening to this on. Follow, share. Um, this conversation, obviously, it's widespread. There's a lot of podcasts 
coming up this month and last month there was a lot that came out um, that was really really popular so share the show to someone who you think will benefit from this conversation send it to someone that doesn't believe in climate change yeah <laughs> specifically you surely you'll know somebody send this to them and if you're that person that received this message because you don't believe in climate change now you know and reach out yeah reach out we'd love help. to know yeah. why why do you not believe in <laughs> am i racist is that what that is that's funny um no really appreciate you guys if you're on youtube like comment subscribe all the good good stuff and we'll, we'll speak to you next month thank you so much for co-hosting with me shana yeah thank you for bringing the news it wouldn't be as lovely of a show without you nah i'm just about the right amount of Wrap it up. Wrap it up. All right, until next time, stay happy, eat plants. Peace.